right. Um, okay. Okay, I guess we could get started. Unless anyone knows anyone else who was supposed to come and isn't here. No, good. Okay, I'm just gonna close the door. Okay. Yeah, it's both recording. Yeah. All righty. So, uh, I'm very excited to introduce the speaker today. Her research is really awesome and near to my heart. Cows are some of the best animals out there, I, in my opinion. Uh, and so today we have Dr. Grazine Trisoldi, who is a veterinarian uh, who got her DMB and MSc in Brazil. Then she moved to UC Davis, California, and she's working on her PhD looking at the uh, mitigation of heat stress to improve dairy cattle welfare. Uh, she's got a little intro for her talk here. So her PhD research focuses on mitigating heat stress in dairy cows to improve their welfare. Of course, this is an important welfare concern uh, for the industry, especially in California. Her work addresses how to identify dairy cattle experiencing high heat load and how to optimize cooling strategies for lactating cows. During her doctoral training, Grazine has completed a series of experiments examining water saving and cow cooling strategies for their dairy farms in California. Uh, that is the project that she's going to be talking about now. So take it away, Dr. Tresoldi. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here with me today, <laughs> here in California <laughs> or in well. um, So uh, what I'm gonna talk to you about today, I just wanna give you a brief overview about the California dairy industry. I also, uh, I'm going to talk about heat stress and their implica and its implications for cow welfare, and also about heat abatement strategies. After that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my research and uh, some overall conclusions I had during my PhD here at Davis. So California is the top dairy state here in US and the milk is a major, uh, agricultural commodity here. California has over 2 million cows and they are mostly housed in loose housing systems, such as dry lots, as you can see in your uh, left side. So it's these pans, they are, um, they are dirt floored pans and usually they have a shaded area at, at the resting area and they have a concreted floored feed bunk. And we also have free stalls very similar to what you have in Canada. So you have uh, individual cubicles for the cows you're lying down, um, a feed bunk, and they are usually uh, concreted. Here in California, most of them, they have exercise areas that are similar to um, the dry lots. So as you may all know, California has Mediterranean climate, so we have hot and dry summers. So as you may imagine, these may have a lot of implications for the welfare of the cows here. So heat stress is a sustainability uh, problem uh, because of economic and ethical reasons. So although heat abatement resources, they are widely used, the dairy industry uh, loses millions of dollars every year to, due to uh, exposure to heat load. In addition, uh, heat stress is a major welfare concern. So when cows are hot, they increase the use of heat abatement resources. So for example, as you can see on the top picture, uh, cows, they seek shade uh, to avoid gaining heat by um, radiation. They also uh, increase respiration rates, uh, which improves improves their capacity to lose heat uh, through um, evaporation. And also when cows increase their respiration rates, sometimes you can also observe panting, as you can see on the bottom picture. So this cow has her, her mouth is open and she, uh, her tongue is protruding. Cows may also reduce their line time. And the reason why they do that when they are hot is kind of unknown. We don't know if they stand, um, if it's standing, they increase their ability um, to breathe or because it increases uh, when they are standing out. So it may increase the airflow around them. Um, so we don't know why 
this happens, but we we found this across many studies. Cows also will reduce uh, feeding and movement and activity in general when they're hot. So we know um, a digestion produces a lot of heat. So reducing uh, feeding take or time feeding may also uh, reduce heat production. So, uh, and if these strategies, they don't work, cows may experience elevated body temperature, uh, disease risk, and in extreme cases, mortality. Their milk production and uh, fertility may also be impaired during summer months. So to help cows to cope with heat load, producers uh, provide um, heat abatement resources, such as shade. So as you can see here on the left side, we have uh, a dry lot dairy and the cows have access to shade on the resting areas. So, and on the, uh, on the right hand side, you have a free, a free stall and usually barns are naturally, naturally shaded. Cows may also have access to fans and spray water. So spray water is usually provided at the um, feed line and also at the milking parlor at the holding area. So although these resources uh, are widely used by farmers, uh, little is known about how and what combination these resources are provided, uh, and neither their cooling effectiveness. So one of my first projects during my PhD was to describe uh, the provision of heat abatement resources uh, in commercial dry lot areas here in California. And also to describe the behavioral and physiological responses to heat load in these same dairies. So for that, uh, I visited 10 dairies in Tulare area. So here I have a map of California. So I'm here in Davis near Sacramento and Tulare County is the county that has uh, the largest number of dairy cows here in California. And I just pointed out LA on the bottom so you guys can have a, a reference where Tulare is. So the dairies I visited, they had from almost 600 to almost uh, 4,000 cows. And I spent uh, three days per dairy where I evaluated a total of more than six, 1,600 high producing cows. So my cows were producing about 38 kilograms kilograms of milk per day. So in these dairies, I measured the housing and cooling strategies provided. So for example, I measured uh, quantity of shade and distribution of shade, quantity of water sprayed, number of fans, water troughs, and so on. I also measured in these farms behavioral and physiological response to heat load. So I measured use of cooling resources, respiration rates, painting, line time, feeding, and movement and activity. So in this study, I found that some dairies were doing very well while others faced challenges. So for example, in terms of respiration rates, I found that in some dairies, uh, the average was low as 65 breaths per minute, while in other dairies, it could be as high as nine, five breaths per minute. And just to give you an idea about what these high numbers mean to the cows, other studies have found that these high respiration rates were uh, accompanied by painting and also by the temperatures of 40.5 degrees Celsius. And to give you another idea about what these values mean to the cows, so uh, the minimum fever threshold is 39.2 degrees Celsius, So, which means these cows were really hot. So these dairies also varied in terms of cooling strategies uh, used. So for example, the quantity of water used to cool cows uh, at the feed line could range from almost two liters per cow per hour to almost 26 liters per cow per hour. And this number uh, was generated from a combination from different flow rates, timing strategies, so usually um, sprinklers they run a uh, time on and a time off, and I will talk a little bit uh, uh, more about it later on. And also, this quantity of water was also product of the, uh, the ratio nozzle and cow. So 
differently than respiration rates at that time, we didn't know what these values in terms of quantity of water uh, meant to the cows because we had the limited information available regarding uh, water volume and cooling effectiveness for high producing cows at that time. And also our study, we had a small sample size. So we just evaluated 10 dairies and uh, this small sample size, because we had this small sample size, we couldn't determine which strategies were associated with better cooling. But the one thing I couldn't let go was when I was looking uh, at a different individual farms, I found that the, the dairies that were providing the least amount of water were not the dairies that the cows were doing the worst. And, and also the dairies that were using um, the largest amount of water also were not the dairies that were doing better. So this combination between variation across dairies and these confusing anecdotal results so suggested me that we had opportunities to improve our understanding of cow cooling and water use efficiency. So how can we how can we improve cow cooling and water use efficiency? Well, uh, first, uh, I think we have to understand which aspects can affect water use and cooling effectiveness. So water use is affected by spray management. So activation temperature, so, at the, so the temperature that triggers the spray, flow rate, spray type, and timing that the water is turned on and off, they all can affect the quantity of water use, but they also can affect how cows use the spray, and this all together can affect cooling effectiveness. However, cooling effectiveness is a little bit more complex than that, and other factors can affect uh, uh, this scheme. So for example, we know that cows are highly motivated to use shade, and that shade can also affect the cooling effectiveness when it's combined with water. In addition, uh, increasing water volume not always result in more cooling. So for example, when manipulating uh, different flow rates, uh, another other studies found that no addition, uh, they didn't observe additional cooling benefits when uh, using more water than a certain threshold. So in water words, sometimes using more water doesn't result in more cooling effectiveness. So during my PhD, I really became interested in studying the timing for three main reasons. One, the timing affects the quantity of water use. It also, I found a lot of variation on the, on the dairies I surveyed in these studies. So for example, for time on, some dairies will keep it on for one minute, for less than one minute, and some dairies will keep the water on for six minutes before turning it off. And also, uh, I was interested in studying timing because it is connected to how the spray cools the cows. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how do we think that this spray, uh, this spray works. So as I mentioned before, the, usually this spray works with a time on and off. So when this spray is on, we expect that the water will carry away some of the heat from the body. So we expect that the water that gets in is a little cooler and will uh, leave the cow being a little warmer. And we also expect when the, the spray is on, it's going to generate a cooler microclimate around the cow, and that will help uh, cooling them. So when the water is turned off, we expect that the water that is trapped on the cold will evaporate. And that process of converting fluid water into vapor uh, uh, requires a lot of energy. So cows have to lose a lot of energy in order to make this process happen. And this is thought to be the main mechanism of how cows uh, are cooled uh, with sprinklers or spray. So although this theoretical approach is widely accepted, 
there we have like little scientific evidence of how this spray timing affects cow cooling. And this idea led me to my next experiment where uh, I had as objective to evaluate how spray duration, so how time on affects time it takes for the coat to dry and physiological response to heat load up to 30 minutes after the end of the spray application. So using a crossover design, I tested five different durations. So I sprayed cows for 0 0.5, 1.5, 3, and 13 minutes. Uh, and I apply these different spray durations in 15 hosting cows that were producing about 38 kilograms of milk per day. And every treatment was applied only once and it was replicated three times per cow when air temperature averaged 31 degrees Celsius. So in this study, I measured before and after the spray and, after, and every three minutes three minutes up to 30 minutes. So skin temperature at the shoulder, as you can see here in the top arrow. Uh, skin temperature at the leg and also surrounding air temperature at the leg. Respiration rates. And I also measured cold wetness using cobalt chloride, chloride paper. So the cobalt chloride paper is blue when it's dry and it becomes pink when it's uh, when it's wet so today i'm just going to talk about my results for coat uh, wetness and respiration rates so in this study i found that cooling benefits were more pronounced when water was sprayed for longer so here i have a graph where i'm showing on the y-axis changes on respiration rates from before to after uh, the spray application and on my x-axis I have the treatments so as you may notice changes in respiration rates were more pronounced when water was sprayed for 13 minutes so spraying cows for 13 minutes decreased respiration rates in almost uh, 25 breaths per minute in this study I also found that spray duration had little biological effect on time it took uh, it took the coat to dry. So, although I had some statistical differences across treatments, so I have here minutes to dry on y uh, axis and treatments on x axis. So, regardless of these uh, statistical differences, it took 14 to 16 minutes for the coat to dry. I also found in this study that once water was turned off, physiological responses increased. So now again, I'm going to show you another graph where I have respiration rates on the y-axis, but now I have a minute since the spray was turned off on the, uh, the x-axis. And as you can see, regardless of the treatment, once water was turned off, respiration rates, they increased. But there was one exception. So when the coat was drying, so during those 14 to 16 minutes, the cooling benefits, they were more pronounced in winter days. And now here I have again a graph with changes on respiration rates on the uh, y-axis, and I have wind speed on the x-axis. So as you may notice, when the coat was drying, so during those 14 to 16 minutes, respiration rates reduced on windier days. So instead of gaining heat when it was less uh, windy, when it was more windy, they were losing um, some more heat. So in conclusion, in this study, I found that increasing time on reduced uh, physiological responses to heat load. Uh, in this didn't have much influence on time it took for the coach to dry, which ranged from 14 to 16 minutes. And once once water was turned off, uh, heat load increased, except on windier days during the cold drying phase. All right. So after uh, concluding this study, so I 
I I thought, okay, is Frank cows for longer is is better for the cows, but why? So was this an effect of timing or water of volume? So and this mixed picture was also evident in the literature, not only on my study. So other studies have found that when they increase time on or reduce time off, they also um, found differences on heat load. So uh, heat load was reduced. But again, these studies, as mine, were confounded with water volume. And another problem that I found in these studies that was at the end of the treatments that they are applied, the cows were uncooled. So their body temperature after receiving the treatment was similar to other studies that cows didn't have access to spray water. So because of all these reasons, I decided to run another study where I evaluated the cooling effectiveness of four different spray strategies applied for 45 minutes. So in these spray strategies that I evaluated, they vary in terms of time on and off and also water volume. And now I, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the treatments because it's a little bit complicated. So I just, I'm just trying to make it simple. So two of my treatments, the ones that I call 20 and 2 and a half, uh, they had the same water volume sprayed, so about 20 liters uh, per cow per hour. So I standardized everything in cow uh, in a base of per cow per hour so to make to make easy to compare uh, the comparisons across studies but these studies they vary but these two treatments excuse me they vary both in times on and off so my 20 treatment i kept the water on for three minutes and i turn it off for 12 minutes and my two and a half treatment i uh, I use half of this time, so I spray cows for one minute and a half, and I held the water off for six minutes. So again, just to explain the rationale, I used the same water volume for both treatments, but their timing was half. So this was the only way I found I could manipulate timing, but not water volume. And again, just to give you a visual about my treatment, so I have 20 on the top row and 20 half on the bottom row. So each being here represents one minute and a half. So for my 20, uh, 20 treatment, I spray cows for three minutes and I allow their coat to dry for 12 minutes. And for my 20 half treatment, I spray them for one minute and a half, I allowed six minutes for the coach to dry, spray again one minute and a half, allowed uh, six, uh, the coach to dry for six minutes. So every 15 minutes for these two treatments, I spray the same water, water volume and the total number of minutes on and off were the same. So my other two treatments were 33 and 33 half. So again, I spray the cows uh, 33 liters of water per cow per hour. In these two treatments, so again, for the 33, I spray cows for three minutes and I held the water off for six minutes. In the 33, half I use half of that time. So I spray cows for one minute and a half and I allow their coach to dry for three minutes. So, and again, I had a shaded control where cows didn't receive any water treatment. So, Again, this design uh, that I propose allowed me to evaluate uh, these, the effectiveness of these strategies asking three different questions. So one, I could ask what are the effects of, uh, of timing of response to heat load when using the same water volume? And I tested this question comparing my 20 and 20 half treatment and my 33 and 33 half treatment. I could, I could, using this design, I could also ask what are the effects of time on on response to heat load comparing my 20 half and my 33 half and my 30, 20 half and 33 treatment. So as you can see, in these two treatments, 
the time off is the same, so six minutes for both treatments, but, but my time on is different. And because my time on is different, I have this confounding effect with water volume. Similarly, I could ask the effects of time off on response to heat load, again, using two, uh, two models, one comparing uh, 12 versus six minutes. Again, time on was the same. Uh, three and three in these two treatments. And again, because I'm manipulating just uh, time off, I have differences on water volume. And I could also ask the same question comparing my 20 half and 33 half treatment. So here again, time on is the same, one minute and a half, and I have different times off, six versus three minutes, and water volume is different, 20 and 33. So I tested these five treatments uh, using a crossover design, using 20 hosting cows producing 39 kilograms per milk per day. And every treatment was replicated twice per cow uh, when air temperature um, averaged 29 degrees Celsius. In this study, I measure basically all the same variables I measured in the study before. But at this time, I also measured body temperature using these uh, data loggers that were insert, inserted uh, in the cow's vagina. So in this study, I found when using the same water volume, spray timing had no effect on cow cooling. So what I'm going to show you now is a graph uh, with body temperature on the uh, y-axis and I have time since uh, treatment is started on um, the x-axis but the values that I'm going to present is just the difference from the beginning to the end of the treatment. So here I found when using 20 liters of water but the temperature was reduced in 0.2 degrees Celsius after 45 minutes so these squares represent my shade only treatment. So you, as you can see, uh, but the temperature increases over time. And here, uh, the darker triangles represent my 20 half and the lighter, the 20 treatment. So I, as you can see, there is this reduction, but it wasn't different uh, across treatments. Uh, but what I really like about this study uh, at the end of the treatments, all cows were cool. So this was something I really appreciate for my studies. I My cows were not hot at the end of the experiment. So, and again, just to give you an idea why I say my cows were cool. So this uh, average body temperature was way below the minimum fever threshold, which is about 39.2 degrees Celsius. Similarly, when using 33 liters of water, but the temperature was reduced, uh, but now the reduction was uh, greater, so 0.4 degrees Celsius. Uh, my graph is showing more or less the same scheme as I showed you before. 33 half is represented by the darker circles and 33 by the lighter. And again, all my cows were cool at the end of the treatment. So when evaluating uh, time on and time off, so I found that spraying water for longer or holding it off for less time were more effective strategies to cool cows. So here uh, I'm showing a graph. All the graphs I'm showing now is on the um, y-axis, uh, differences in body temperature, and on the x-axis, my treatment. So here I found when spraying for spraying cows for three minutes more effectively reduce body temperature than uh, when spraying cows for one minute and a half. And this is very clear on the graph. So you have 0.4 versus almost 0.3. Similarly, when keeping water off for six minutes more effectively reduce body temperature in comparison to keep, keeping water off for 12 minutes, so again, you can see this difference, very similar to the results I presented before. And again, keeping water off for three minutes 
again, more effectively reduce body temperature than six minutes. So in conclusion, in this study, I found that timing affected cow cooling only when also manipulating water volume. So in what other words, increasing time on or reducing time off improved cooling. Uh, and again, increasing water volume increased cooling. And in this study, I found when using the same water volume, timing had no effect on cow cooling. All right, so just let me drink some water. So again, I found that, okay, timing has an effect on physiological responses to heat load, but in all these situations, the cows were restrained. So they didn't have the choice to use the spray or not, or when to use it. So uh, I, I was interested in understanding the effects of the timing also on the behavior of the cows. And I had a couple of reasons to believe why the timing could affect behavior. Um, and they were, other studies have found that cows, they wait until the water is turned off in order to leave the spray area. And also cows, they, um, they are attracted to cooling, cooler microclimates. So maybe the timing could affect uh, the microclimate and this could affect uh, cows' behavior. So next, I designed another study uh, where I evaluated the combined, combined effects of spray timing and flow rates on behavior, physiology, and production of their cows housed in a freestyle barn. So basically, I mimic a commercial situation, but providing uh, different uh, combinations between timing and flow rate. So my timing treatments in this study uh, were one that I call high frequency, that I spray cows for one minute and a half and I allow the cow to dry for three minutes. And another one that I call low frequency, that I spray cows for three minutes and I allow their coats to dry for six minutes. So as you may notice, this design is very similar to the study I presented before. Um, and here I'm manipulating timing, but I'm not manipulating again water volume because I, I wanted to uh, untangle these factors. And for my flow rates, I use one delivering 4.9 liters uh, of water per, per minute, and other that deliver 3.3 liters of water per minute. And I chose these two flow rates because they are uh, commonly used in California farms. And at the end, I had these four treatments. Uh, the ones that I call 33 high and 33 low, and the ones that I call 22 high and 22 low. And again, the 33 and 22 represent the uh, quantity of water delivered per cow per hour. So I tested these uh, four treatments on responses to heat load and production in 12 pairs of hosting cows producing uh, about 36 kilograms of milk per day. I applied uh, every treatment for three days uh, in each pair and uh, my my spray line was at the feed bunk and the water runs from 8 15 a.m to 11 30 p.m so in this window air temperature averaged 27 degrees celsius and just to give you an idea about how hot were my afternoons so air temperature averaged 32 degrees celsius so uh, in this study, I measured continuously location in the pen and line time because I wanted to know uh, how often uh, and for how long cows were visiting the spray area. And I was also interested in knowing uh, more about their line behavior. Also, I measured every three minutes, 24 hours a day, but the temperature and feeding time when the cows were at the feed bunk from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. every 45 minutes, I measure respiration rates, and every milking, I measure milk production. So in this study, I found that flow rate and spray timing had no effect on location in the pan or line and feeding time. 
So overall, across 24 hours, my cows spend about six hours at the feed bunk area and other 12 hours and a, and a half lying down. And from the time that my cows were at the feed bunk area, they spend almost 80% of their time feeding. So both my feeding time while the cows were at the feed bunk and my line times are at the upper range in comparison to other studies I found in the literature and my time spent at the feed bunk is in the middle. So other studies cows spend less time at the feed bunk while in other studies they spend more time. Now I'm gonna show you a series of graphs where I have my four treatments on the uh, x-axis and I have changes on, res uh, sorry, respiration rates or body temperature on the uh, y-axis. So in this study, I also found that flow rate and spray timing did not affect respiration rates, as you may see, but um, all my cows were relatively cool regardless of treatment as my respiration rates average 58 breaths per minute. And if you may recall my first study about um, uh, uh, my, uh, my first study I conducted in California, there is the minimum respiration rates I found was 65. So this is very in the, in the lower range, I would say, in comparison to other farms. Uh, in this study, I also found that higher flow rate tended to reduce body temperature. So when using the green nozzles, uh, my body temperature ever, my, no, the cows, body temperature average 38.6 degrees Celsius, while when using the blue nozzles, um, my body temperature av average 38.7 degrees Celsius. So, uh, and these differences, they were more marked between 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. So here I have a graph showing time of the day on the uh, x-axis and we have body temperature on the y-axis. And as you can see here is somehow uh, a circadian pattern of the body temperature in cows. Usually body temperature is cooler um, at the, in the early morning and cows tend to gain heat or become warmer throughout the day, being the warmest around at the beginning of the night. So what you will see in a, in, in a situation where cows didn't have access to spray water, you see a huge bump over here. So they gain a lot of heat uh, at the warmest part of the day. Because uh, I was providing a lot of water, so you you see there is is very flat uh, at this time. And again, all these stars here are showing the differences uh, between my higher flow rates versus the lower flow rates at these times. And again, another thing that I'm proud that regardless of the treatment, all my cows were cool as their body temperature was below the 39.2 degrees Celsius, which is the minimum uh, fever threshold for cattle. Similarly to uh, body temperature, higher flow rate had tended to improve milk production in about uh, 1.5 kilograms per day. So when spraying with the green nozzles, cows produce about 38 kilograms of milk per day. And when spraying them with the blue nozzles, they produce 30, 36.5 kilograms per day. All right, so it seems that uh, like more water is better, but is, is it? So we, let's recap a little bit of my results. So I found that a higher flow rate tended to be better and the differences were small and the biological relevance is unclear. So especially in this situation where all cows were relatively cool, uh, were cool relative to the other studies. So I don't really know what those 0.1 degrees Celsius mean to these cows when their body temperature average is 38.6, 38.7 7 degrees Celsius. So in conclusion, the 22 uh, liters per hour treatment, so using the lower, 
uh, the lower flow rate was as effective as the 33 liters per hour per cow treatment, which means that the 33 um, liters per hour had poor efficiency, that so using more water resulted in similar cooling. But one of the problems uh, when using a lower flow rates is the droplet size. So um, usually producers are concerned about the lower flow rates that they produce very small droplets that can drift uh, and they can wet the, the cow's feed. So we still have to investigate if for this uh, lower flow rate, the droplet size is large enough to minimize it. And again, uh, in these studies, spray timing did not affect behavior and consequently it didn't affect cooling effectiveness. So after spending many, many hours drinking coffee and thinking about it, I finally conclude from all my studies that increasing time on resulted in cooler cows and that spray timing only affect cooling when it results in higher water volume. So in other words, when manipulating spray timing, water volume affects cow cooling. So in this case, when we manipulate the timing and increasing water use, we may have more cooling. And as you may recall, this is different than other studies found before for flow rates, where increasing water volume didn't affect cooling effectiveness. So again, uh, just to kind of uh, walk my, my way back around my first study. So I found in all my studies, cows were cool. Uh, and especially when using as low as 20 liters uh, of water per cow per hour. So, which means that it is possible to cool cows using 20% less water than some California, some California farms are doing. Uh, and this means that some California dairies need to be also more efficient in terms of water use and cow cooling, because some of these dairies are using a ton of lot of water and they are not even getting cool cows. Uh, and one thing that I, I like to mention that is uh, when I designed my studies, I took a very conservative approach because I really wanted to make sure my cows were cool uh, to avoid situations like this one that you can see in the bottom. But I really believe now that I'm finishing up my, my PhD that it's possible to cool cows using even less water than this. And so how do I now think that we can improve cow cooling and water use efficiency? Well, I think we have some opportunities on adjusting the spray timing. So we could try other combinations uh, than I tried. But I also think that we should provide shade and additional airflow that spray line. So we know that cows will not, we have, it's not that we know, we have strong evidence that cows will not use uh, spray water unless it is provided underneath the shade, especially during the warmest part of the day. And we also found that the air, the air flow contributes to heat losses during that cold drying phase. Uh, and I also think we should do a better job on in the identifying cows experiencing high heat load because this is something that uh, sometimes producers cannot realize until they lose a ton a lot of a, a ton of milk well that that's all i had for today and i'm happy to take any questions and thank you very much any questions for dr Tristoldi? oops sorry i just trying to get back to this screen. There we go. Yep. Um, hi. Do I need to introduce myself or just go ahead and ask? So, among all the options that you had in the market to uh, pick one device to measure the temperature, why did you go ahead and pick the, um, like, why did you decide to 
use the temperature logger and the vaginal one? Because okay, yeah. yeah. So we were looking for something that had high um, accuracy and reliability. And also the size was very important how to, we needed to find a device um, that was small enough, but is not is small enough to be inside the cows, but also large enough for us to connect to the blank seeders. So at the, the time that we bought these data loggers, it was maybe 2015, so three years ago. So uh, these tyrodes, they had the better accuracy for what we were looking for. So they are 0.01, if I'm correct. I know they are, or point one, they are very, very low. Um, I don't recall uh, exactly the number, but it's something point one or point oh one. I think it's point one, yeah, because the uh, eye buttons is point five to up to one degree Celsius. So point one, uh, and also because their size was very compatible to attach to the blank seeders. Yeah, that was the main reason we tested other things we we had this uh hobo that was at, like we tested this hobo and somebody in hawaii made this device that had like these uh silicone fingers but i had a bad experience with those so we decided to do with something that we could attach to the sitters you didn't use those uh because I saw that you also measured the temperature, like you used the other devices that was in the cow's leg. Did you? Yeah. For those one, for those ones, I use the eye buttons. Yeah. So and I chose to use them because the eye buttons they can sense the temperature in both sides, and they are, and that was the only way I could measure air surrounding air temperature and skin temperature using the same device because I could opt to use an infrared gun, but that, would, that wouldn't that allow me to measure the surrounding air temperature in the same scale. Oh yeah, you might wanna get closer to that. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering what you use to measure the location of the cows within the pens. Like, okay. Video recording? Yeah, I use video recording to measure that. So I did, so I had sections in my home pen. Uh, they were mostly marked on the ground. So my students could see on the video and we had some definitions about what is at feed bunk and near feed bunk and lying area. So I use video cameras for okay. that. And did you also use them for measuring the lying time? Correct. I use the same, yeah. I didn't want to, I could opt to use, again, hobo loggers or any other device that could give me uh, automatized data. But since my students were already watching that, so I thought one less thing for the cows to carry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, I have a question. So I know you said you want to be conservative with your approach and not subject the cows to very high levels of heat, but do you think you're, you would have seen a difference um, in maybe the timing or the, um, the flow rate, cat, um, whew, the flow rate treatments if you had used more different flow rates? That's a great question. Uh, not with, I, I'm not too concerned about flow rates because that has been studied in more detail before. So we know that flow rates don't affect cooling and they don't affect um, use of the spray area as found in other studies before. But the timing, uh, I'm not sure because actually and I had this when I was in the farms doing my other study 
one of the things why I also decided to study the timing is like I had this impression that some cows will not be willing to wait when the water was turned off for too long. Uh, and this is something different than I had in this study because I was my study now was in a freestyle and I was studying on dry lots. And dry lots, the distance between the feed bunk area until the shade area, so it's kind of, it can vary from 10 to 30 meters. So the cows, they have to trade off, right? Because they are sometimes standing over the concrete and they don't have shade. So the place where this spray is versus, okay, I can stand here or I can go to the shaded area that has dirt underneath. So I think they have more trade-offs on a dry lot. And my impression was on that situation, cows will, will not, they wouldn't be willing to wait forever for the water. So I, I, I'm still thinking about this. I may think that timing may have an effect on behavior, but in a different scenario than the one I tested, maybe. Um, yeah. I'm not 100% convinced that timing doesn't affect behavior. <laughs> So, at all. So I think I maybe if I have time in the future, or if I want to pursue this question still, I may do something else. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any more questions? Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. Uh, so in what, uh, the last slide, you said that one of the ways for future, one of uh, probably is identifying cows experiencing high heat load. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any method in mind that how we can do that? Like, yeah. So one of the approaches that I have been using is respiration rates. Mm -hmm. So once I started working with heat stress, I started looking. Okay what these numbers mean like actually we don't have a clear answer on the literature if you look at the values that we say that are normal for the cows respiration rate should range from 20 to 40 breaths per minute and this doesn't happen during the summer so i have another project where i i i was looking respiration rates throughout the year to have a better idea about okay what is normal respiration rates for the cows so, and I think respiration rates is a, er, an early indicator of heat stress. So it's like a first barrier, right? Uh, it's a first mechanism. So they start feeling hot, they will seek uh, heat abatement resources. And if those ones are not being sufficient, they may, or maybe simu simultaneously, they may also increase their, their respiration rates to increase heat losses. Uh, through evaporation. So I think we should, my idea is respiration rates can tell us a lot about a heat load and way before body temperature to be elevated and even way before we see uh, changes in new production and fertility. So I think this is a way to go. And I was also during my PhD, I study a lot the relationship between respiration rates and panting signs. So I evaluated all those different, so panting can be drooling, open mouth and protruding tongue. So I was interested how these signs compare to respiration rates and what I found is regardless of the sign, they are shows, a cow show, cows show them when their respiration rates are higher. So, I think there are a few possibilities on this field between respiration rates and panting, and we are trying to figure that out. So, do you have any idea how long will it take that body temperature goes up after the like how long will it take to show? <laughs> That's a great question, and I would love to have an answer <laughs> for that. Uh, but I don't think, honestly, looking at the literature, you see different things, there is no pattern. People attempt to say that respiration rates after a cert certain threshold 
they will increase, they like respiration rates will increase with body temperature, but we know that cows have some limitation on the respiration rates. They cannot increase respiration rates forever because there is a physical capacity. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't have an answer for that. I wish I had. <laughs> So I guess we'll wrap it up if that's the last question. So yeah, thank you so, so much, Dr. Trisoldi. That was an excellent talk. And um, thank you all for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me on <laughs> by distance. <laughs> Do I just stop recording? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just for a second. Probably like a probe or something. It's a while. Right. Like, so,